Princess Midway International Airport at Chicago, world's busiest air transportation center. Giant aircraft arrive or depart every 60 seconds. Thousands of people pass through the terminal each day. A few hours ago, some of them were in San Francisco, or London, or Bombay. A few hours from now, others will be in New York, or Rome, or Honolulu, or some other distant point. p.m. March 17, 1960, Flight 710 departed from Midway. Destination, Miami International Airport. Minutes later, the huge craft was soaring over the wintry Indiana landscape. Fifty-seven men, women, and children, and six crewmen were aboard. Among the occupants were executives on business missions and visitors from foreign countries. Others were vacation-bound, looking to fun on sun-warmed beaches or reunions with relatives and friends. The miles drifted lazily behind, 18,000 feet over the radio range station at Scotland, 710 reported everything normal. Then, high above the clouds, something went wrong. Several people saw the stricken luxury liner fall. Farmer Cyril Powers recalls it this way. This wing come through the clouds, and then in a, oh, I'd say a mile or so, the fuselage and the left wing come through, and, and I watched it fall all the way to hit the ground. Well, after it hit the ground, then there was a, I wouldn't say it was an explosion. Of course, it did blow up, but it was more of a big whooshing sound that went up, and clothing and debris went, I'd say, all oh, from between 102 or 300 feet high in the air. When it hit the ground, it just felt like the ground just dropped out from under me and then come back. And then the concussion rocked me first backwards and then back towards the plane. And that's just about all I could tell you about it. The concussion had jarred the William Rhodes home six miles away. Mrs. Rhodes ran from her kitchen and saw a flaming object falling from the clouds. She telephoned Indiana State Police at Jasper. Her alert action, followed quickly by calls from other witnesses, set in motion the machinery that would speed emergency forces to the scene from widely scattered points in the state and nation. The sergeant on post command contacts the radio room and issues orders. The first police job, locate the crash. Second assignment, evaluate the seriousness of the situation. Search for survivors. Mobilize rescue forces. Troopers in the area are alerted by radio and race toward the crash reported east of Candleton. Additional reports that filter in from citizens at widely separated points suggest two airplanes may have collided in midair. A second wave of troopers is dispatched. Fifty miles away at Evansville, a state police patrol plane turns toward Candleton to look for wreckage and coordinate ground forces. As the magnitude of the disaster becomes clear, estimates of police requirements are revised. The Jasper duty officer dispatches the laboratory field service vehicle. There may be a need for technicians to help identify victims and recover and preserve evidence for federal investigators. The troopers must be held to handle other law enforcement duties as well. Manpower is assigned carefully. Local rescue agencies have already received the emergency flash and are on the way. Patel City and Candleton Police Department send men and equipment. And the firefighting organizations of the two towns are en route. The Perry County Sheriff's advice will be invaluable. He knows this rural district. The state police plane arrives over the scene and begins to fly widening circles, seeking evidence of survivors and a second downed aircraft. 
Bits of wreckage blackening the snow are marked for recovery by men who will comb the rugged hill country on foot later. Jasper sends a bulletin to General Headquarters at Indianapolis. Other messages follow as new information is developed. The situation at Candleton comes into sharper focus. Indianapolis receives a request for additional assistance. One airplane, not two, as first reported, had plunged into a field just short of the Ohio River. Troopers at the scene had found no sign of life. The superintendent of state police is at his desk studying each report. Later, he takes direct charge of his men at the scene. At Indianapolis Operations Center, the staff tackles its organization job. Supplies for a temporary morgue are requisitioned. Laboratory technicians and identification specialists are ordered to Candleton. Calls are made to identify the fallen plane. The senior officers try to anticipate every need of the investigative force. A short time after the emergency was first reported, the movement of men and supplies had started to Perry County from many points across Indiana. The Jasper District Commander orders a power generator sent to provide illumination for round-the-clock operation. Security guards are set. A special telephone line is ordered to support radio contact and arrangements made to house and rotate troopers. A state police portable radio station which replaces a temporary communication system of relays by patrol cars provides a vital link with the outside. An intensive exploration of the crater and surrounding area begins at daybreak. Road blockades seal off the scene to keep sightseers from interfering with officials and the movement of equipment. Authorized workers wear identifying tags. Officials go aloft in the state police helicopter to view the crater. was here, the sleek liner struck with grinding force and burrowed deep into the hard earth. The impact tore clods loose and hurled them in a wide explosion pattern. Surface mud was plastered on tree trunks hundreds of feet away. It was here that 63 men, women and children died, 41 minutes after taking off from Chicago. Workers probed the crater and find the near vertical fall had left but few traces of the plane and its occupants. Troopers and Indiana National Guard personnel explore the snowy tract for fragments of tissue. Such violent destruction never before had been witnessed. Men of the Civil Aeronautics Board, Federal Aviation Agency, Federal Bureau of Investigation, the airline, and plane manufacturer begin a preliminary study. Perry County presents one of southern Indiana's great scenic spectacles. Its sweeping valleys and wooded hills retain the classic beauty first seen by the early settlers. The broad Ohio glides smoothly at the foot of the county. That is, most of the time. In times past, the people of Candleton and neighboring Tell City have learned about trouble from the river. Many of them can recall disasters caused when the Ohio burst its banks before flood walls harnessed its waters. And so the Perry community responded when word of the tragedy was flashed. The Candleton News, Tell City News, and WTCJ Radio kept citizens advised about how they could help. Civic, business, and fraternal organizations stepped forward to lend a hand. Here was an opportunity for citizens to show their compassion in time of need, to assist the official agencies carry out their demanding assignments. Public-spirited ladies representing business, social, and religious groups gather in kitchens daily to bake cookies and prepare other food. 
the women's auxiliaries of fraternal clubs convert beef and vegetables into a savory stew that sticks to the ribs of the workers who eat it. Uncounted gallons of coffee are brewed and varieties of food contributed each day. Everybody finds a job to do and does it. The men of Cannelton and Tell City leave workaday duties and support the ladies. Containers of stew and coffee delivered hot and nourishing. It's a demonstration of the best in good citizenship by warm-hearted townspeople. It's maintained by the Salvation Army and American Red Cross are an oasis in the middle of the somber surroundings. A bowl of stew. A cookie. And a hot cup of coffee provide a welcome break a moment of relaxation. Junior Chamber of Commerce members organize a community-wide appeal for housing for relatives and friends of the crashed dead. Young men devote a part of their business days and evenings to canvassing citizens. The reaction is heartwarming. Chief coordinator of the community activity is the local chapter of the Red Cross. The secretary and her staff of volunteer workers remain tirelessly at their posts. Of prime concern to the investigators at this stage is the whereabouts of sections which had broken away from the falling aircraft. The state police helicopter sweeps into the air to retrace 710's flight path. Wreckage may provide an important clue as to the cause of the accident. An engine is discovered on a wooded hillside. It's pinpointed on a map for recovery crews. FBI and state police executives leave an army copter after completing an aerial survey of a troublesome problem, the transfer of scores of accredited personnel between the crater and the highway. A few cars can choke the narrow gravel road. A fleet of jeeps assigned to truckway squads of state troopers begins a shuttle service. Their drivers average more than 100 round trips a day. Congestion is eliminated as authorized vehicles move freely over the road. Indiana's governor, who authorized full use of state facilities to excavate instead of seal the crater, makes a personal inspection. His decision shortened the investigation. Changeable March weather ranging from sub-freezing to the warm 70s alternately plagues and comforts. A thawing trend is followed by more snow. It's during this second wintry outburst that the United States Senators from Indiana arrive to view the situation. This secluded patch of farmland has become the center of national interest. What caused Flight 710 to fall? An air of urgency is apparent as investigators look for the answer. Agreement is reached on a plan of attack to remove the buried plane. It's necessary to resurface a mile-long stretch of county highway so heavy road-building equipment furnished by the State Highway Department can be moved in. Then, roaring bulldozers begin to push the earth away from the crater. The objective is to scrape away the surface rubble and ease the work of reaching the plane and bodies. Approximately eight feet of soil is removed from the top of the field. A close watch is kept for bits of wreckage and valuables, although investigators now know most of this material is buried deep in the clay bottom land. Viewed from the air, the bulldozers carve an unusual pattern as the work progresses. Several days after the crash, serious exploration of the hole gets underway. Two stem shovels dip great scoops of debris. Now a real headway is being made toward what lies within the still smoldering earth. Every shovelful will have a meaning to the men whose job it is to determine the cause of the accident. One feels an underlying tension among the workmen. Unknown things, tragic things, are soon to be revealed. A woman's sandal, a twisted valve, an earring are sifted from the rubbish. Warm temperatures return, the thawing field becomes a sea of sticky mud, but the digging goes on at a steady pace.
the deepening crater discloses the devastation resulting from the crash. Fragments of bodies are collected in baskets and carried through the mire by grim-faced men. Parts believed identifiable are placed in plastic bags and carefully marked. Then the bags are loaded into a state police laboratory wagon and transported to a makeshift morgue in Cannelton. Two miles away in a hilltop pasture, a crew prepares to remove a wing that had torn off the plane in its dying seconds. A cutting torch is used to disassemble it. It's marked for reassembly later. Removal of the heavier parts from the back country is accomplished by an airlift supplied by a fleet of Army helicopters from Fort Knox, Kentucky. The giant birds carry out many time-saving missions, including liaison duty, aerial survey, and transportation of wreckage from inaccessible points. Winging over hills and valleys, the copter heads for an assembly point in a field adjoining the crater. The wreckage is carried in a steel mesh cargo net. Skilled pilots bring in the ship and hold it a few feet off the ground. Then a crewman trips the mechanism, which disengages the net. Thirty-three men of an Army Graves Registration Unit from Fort Lee, Virginia, arrive to remove and prepare the remains for identification. As the work of probing the crater continues, it becomes apparent that few bodies will be recovered. Nearby, a crack team of disaster experts from the Federal Bureau of Investigation in Washington sets up a field headquarters. They use detailed descriptions of the plane's occupants, speedily assembled by other special agents over the country, to trace the victims' identities. While positive, identification is not possible in many cases, the agents are able to make legible prints from the fingers of a few of the passengers and crewmen. Workers in the crater area wear surgical masks smeared with a deodorant to lessen the smell of death. Teamwork among the official groups present is evident. Ideas and assistance are freely exchanged. Investigators of the Civil Aeronautics Board decide on an intensive ground search to recover portions of the plane which drifted over a wide track as the disintegrating aircraft fell. 400 Army troops from Fort Knox arrive ready for the assignment. The detachment bivouacs in a field near the crater. Soldiers set about making a camp as the sun drops toward the horizon. Gear is unloaded swiftly under the watchful eyes of the commanders and magically, a tent city appears, complete with the latest mechanized equipment. It's true, an army travels on its stomach and there's cooking to be done. But with all the mechanization, potatoes are still peeled the hard way. At a post on the perimeter of the camp, an armed sentry begins his lonely vigil. A mile or so away as darkness falls, state troopers man a road blockade. They're ready to hurry to the scene of an emergency and remain until it's over. They make up in mobility what they lack in numbers. Policeman E2, unable to leave his post, this man shows his culinary artistry to early morning passers-by. When the temperature is a frosty 16 above, a breakfast of sausage and eggs with buttered toast and coffee gives a man something to live for. Breakfast, cooked in the rear of a patrol car. The only thing missing is the morning paper. The troops are stirring as the sun reddens the eastern sky. They have a tough day ahead, tramping over some of Perry County's roughest terrain. But it is more than a training problem. They may recover a fragment that will help investigators solve the mystery of what happened to Flight 710. The search is fruitful. Numerous pieces of shattered metal are found in the location of each logged on a surveyor's map.
It's Sunday, and attention is given to the spiritual needs of the men. It's a time when they can put aside the cares of the day and meditate on the meaning of life and their place in the scheme of things. Across the road, an army chaplain leads a religious service for a second group. A hymn played on an organ fills the air. Then there's a prayer while the men bow their heads reverently and a scripture lesson by the young chaplain. Then it's time for the soldiers to file away to complete the day's chores. Everyone pitches in to hurry the task to its final conclusion. The state police helicopter in the air from morning until night ferries officials into the hinterlands to interview witnesses. Seventeen civil engineers use the copter in plotting a topographic map of wreckage in its relation to the crater location. Administrative functions are handled by a radio and a special telephone line extended five miles cross-country to the state police field headquarters. State conservation officers work with the troopers and soldiers. Citizen volunteers under official guidance patrol the solitary hills. Overall control of the investigation is in charge of CAB executives. Daily sessions are attended by governmental and civilian representatives, at which time progress reports are heard and plans firmed up for the next day's effort. One of the saddest duties falls on the county coroner, that of interviewing relatives of the deceased and listing the multiple deaths in the official record. A few hours after the accident, the coroner and technicians had opened a receiving center for the remains in the community building at Camelton. When it became clear a day or so later that but few bodies would be recovered, the space was used by authorities for other purposes. But the forbidding sign remains on the door. Sacks of clothing picked off the ground or from high in the trees surrounding the crater are brought to the building and spread on the gymnasium bleachers. The tattered apparel and other personal items must be identified. Mud-stained pocketbooks and handbags containing personal papers and thousands of dollars in currency are carefully cleaned and dried. Jewelry, coins, keys, lodge pins, and religious metals, some bent out of shape, are washed and inspected for the name of the owner. The bleachers serve another purpose a running account of the daily activities of the state policeman is maintained by the Jasper chief clerk who spreads the expanding file over the board seats. The weather threatens again. Workers at the crash site anxiously study gathering rain clouds, fearing a further delay. But the sky clears and digging is pressed at top speed. Fewer pieces are brought out of the hole. It is anticipated the CAB chief investigator will call a halt to the excavation soon. A propeller hub is the last section to be removed. The almost vertical shaft has been carved through hard packed clay to an estimated depth of 50 feet. A guard paces by growing piles of the shattered craft. Investigators are completing their final field examination and are ready to draft their preliminary reports. Airframe specialists make an inch-by-inch inch inspection of broken wing sections. Power plant engineers likewise look for clues which would indicate what was responsible for the March 17th disaster. Nothing is left undone. Workmen clean metal fragments in preparation for the more exacting studies. Final tests will be made under laboratory conditions. The broken remnants of Flight 710, shipped by sealed truck, will be reassembled in a mock-up under supervision of CAB technicians. Later at Evansville, the Civil Aeronautics Board begins another phase of the inquiry. Board members, all veterans in the aviation field, are charged with fixing the causes of aircraft accidents. 
Witnesses testify as to their knowledge of the events that preceded the fatal plunge. Those interrogated include experts and laymen, passengers who deplaned from 710 at Chicago, people who saw it fall, meteorologists, airline executives and maintenance personnel, federal air safety inspectors. The history of the aircraft is painstakingly traced. It is in this way that greater progress and safe air travel will be achieved. On a hill above Tell City, the living are united briefly with their dead at rites arranged by the airline. Relatives and friends gather before flower-decked caskets to hear words of hope and comfort. I am the resurrection and the life. I will lift up mine eyes under the hills from which cometh my help. These are among the ancient phrases of consolation. The recovery is finished. The emergency crews have departed. The sound of an occasional plane marked by a vapor trail high above is the only interruption to the stillness of this remote place in Perry County, Indiana. But the scarred earth is a visible reminder of the compassion of the many people who remembered that even though the disaster victims were strangers, they also were fellow humans. Thank you.